Welcome to Prodi Valley Church at home. I'm Brent, I'm one of the pastors here at Prodi Valley Church. Great to have you joining our online teaching. We do believe though that for the church to be the church, it really means gathered community and connection to others. If you're visiting, I'd love you to scan the QR code that is on screen right now, and it'll help us to connect you into one of those midweek communities where you can be nurtured, prayed with and prayed for, and where you can be sent out into your neighborhood, into your workspace to make a difference for Jesus' sake. Secondly, we'd love to plug you into one of our serving opportunities. There are just countless spaces in the life, work and ministry in the church and out from the church into the broader community. And we'd love to take what you have been given by God and somehow leverage it to make Jesus' name known amongst the nations. And so we'd love you to connect with us in those ways. If you want any further information, do plug into our online platforms. Our website, proteavalleychurch.org, has all the information you could need and you can connect to us from there. We're going to head straight into last Sunday's online teaching and so let me pray. Father and Son and Spirit, thank you so much for the gift of your great love for us that was exhibited by you creating us, molding us and shaping us in the image of God. Thank you too, Jesus, that you exhibited love for us when you died for us in our place on the cross and that you have allowed us to have the promise of eternal life. But until the day arrives when we are gifted that final gift of eternal life, Lord, we want to be found about the stuff of your kingdom, seeing your kingdom come here on earth. And so may this time of teaching equip us and train us and make us useful for you. And so we ask your blessing now and we ask this in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. Morning, church. Good to be with you this morning. It really is. So we started a series this morning called Breathe. And so I just want you to chat to the person next to you. What do you think is the longest you could hold your breath? What do you think is the longest that you could probably hold your breath? Just just talk to the the person next to you. If you're sitting on your own, maybe you want to find someone and and chat to them just just quickly. far you got, uh, but um, apparently the world record is 24 minutes, 24 minutes. In in fairness, the guy was on pure oxygen before he did his 24 minutes, but 24 minutes, that was set in about 2016 or so, uh, somewhere in the east. That's just incredible amounts of time. So I've been thinking a lot about this breathing thing because, of course, that's the series that we're about to go into. Uh, Timothy and I, uh, my boys and I, uh, went snorkeling a couple of weeks ago, and Timothy and I went out, and he decided he wanted to go down as deep as possible, Uh, and he called me to follow him, and he disappeared down into the murky depths of the ocean, and I sort of got about halfway, looked to where he was, looked up, and decided there is absolutely no ways. He's a swimmer, and so I turned around, started heading up, and started panicking, actually, within myself, because I didn't think I had enough breath in me. Of course, I was exaggerating, and I got to the top and it was fine, but it's the reality that we need to breathe. We have to take oxygen into our lungs literally every couple of seconds, or otherwise something is gonna happen to us that is not helpful. And so Paul, I asked Paul, he's in a connect group I've been part of over the last few weeks, and he just shared of how breathing took on a lot of significance for him when he had COVID. And so, Paul, what, what, what happened to you? In uh, January of 2021, I developed COVID and um, was quite sick. My wife and I were both very sick and sick for 15 days and it just wasn't getting any better and um, ended up um, taking a a blood oxygen test uh, to make sure where I was. And it was 68, which is very bad, (laughs) which means I was dying actually at the time. Um, And so they rushed me to the hospital and um, turns out I had pneumonia in both lungs, top to bottom, 100% pneumonia and ended up in the in, uh, intensive care uh, for nine days. I was in the hospital for a total of 13 days and um, it was quite touch and go a few times, um, especially in the early stages before they figured out how much oxygen I needed and how to get it to me in the right way. Um, I, I nearly died a couple times. So uh, it wasn't, uh, it was pretty difficult. Um, 
but as you mentioned, you, you, you take breathing for granted. I, I, I was breathing very shallowly at home, so I didn't realize how bad my lungs were. Um, and then once you actually start to try and get the stuff out of your lungs, you realize how, how, how full they are of this uh, stuff and that you can't get out and you can't breathe properly. And so my job uh, in the intensive care um, was, besides taking all the medicine and having this thing strapped to my face that was giving me 80 liters of oxygen per minute, <laughs> stuff up, up, I mean, up my nose, um, which is like kind of like a, having a hurricane blow up your nose, <laughs> um, it feels like. And um, had that on, and uh, every morning I got up at 5 o'clock in the morning, and I asked the doctors, what's the most important thing? It's the best thing I can do? For They said, well, the best thing you can do is to sit up as long as possible every day. So I dragged myself out of the bed at 5 o'clock in the morning, and I'd sit in the chair next to my bed, and I would breathe until 9 p.m., and then I would take a sleeping pill and go to sleep and try to sleep as best I could. Uh, on my stomach, which you have to sleep on your stomach when you have COVID uh, pneumonia, so, um, which is very difficult. Um, but the, for, from 5 in the a.m. to 9 p.m., I listened to worship music, and I thought about breathing. That's all I did. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Thank you. We just feel at this point in time as pastors that we need to learn to breathe as a people of God. I think as we listen to stories and as we listen to people around us, uh, it, it kind of feels like people are struggling just to take enough breath into their lungs. And, and by breath, I'm not just talking about oxygen. I'm talking about the, the breath of God, the life of God into us. And the kind of just time is that we have Pentecost at this point uh, in, our, in our spiritual calendar. Uh, we, have, we have feast days and high days. We're talking about Christmas and Easter and Ascension and Pentecost. Uh, and they are days where we remember what God has done and we also are reminded what God wants to do in our lives today. And so today we are reminded that Jesus breathed on his disciples. And so Monique's going to come and read for us two passages of scripture. Firstly, John 22, 19 to 23, and then Acts 2, uh, 1 through to 4, as we begin to uh, look at scripture this morning. Thank you. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Let's uh, pray briefly. Lord Jesus, this morning, would you give us ears to hear your word to us, hearts that would understand, and eyes that would see you, the living word, at work in our midst and in our world. Amen. It's not really a sermon this morning, a little bit shorter perhaps, uh, just a couple of observations I think out of the text and then we'd like to just spend some time um, worshipping through communion and song and uh, praying for each other. Um, more of a space this morning I guess between God and us than perhaps uh, me up front here. So there's two distinct moments in the text that, we, that we've just covered where the disciples experienced God breathing on them. In each passage, God breathes on them. And in, I think it's worth noting that in both texts, it's done within the context of community. I think we underestimate the importance and the significance and the power of community in what God does uh, in us. Uh, COVID has shifted some of our thinking around that. We've seen a number of families not drift back to worship. Uh, but what we're doing here this morning is important. This is community God meets with us here. And so the first time we read in the first text, it's behind locked doors. The disciples are fearful, they're anxious, they're 
incredibly afraid of the Jewish leaders, and so they literally meet in isolation. People of God, yes, but, but kind of the door's locked. They don't want anyone to be able to come in. They want to feel safe. They feel at risk. Jesus steps into the room. Obviously, from the text, he literally passed through the walls, through the door. He just appeared in the room, uh, and he says these words, peace be with you. And he says it twice. I think really important. He says to us, peace be with you. And then he commissions them. After that giving of peace, he commissions them to go into the world and, and make disciples, to be bearers of good news, the hope of, of, of the salvation that he's come to bring for all humanity. No longer afraid, but bold and confident. And then he breathes on them. Receive the Holy Spirit. And the second time is 50 days later at Pentecost. Now Pentecost is a Jewish feast or festival. You may or may not know that. It's not just a Christian festival. It's Jewish. Uh, it used to be understood as kind of a, a festival of, of harvest uh, where the people would gather together and remember what that God had provided for them. It would be at the end of the harvest period. And then later on in history, it began to shift and change towards the giving of the law of Moses. But it would be a gathering of the people to remember God's goodness and his faithfulness, his provision, and his work in their lives. And so the disciples had gathered to celebrate Pentecost as Jewish believers. And as they met and prayed and worshipped, we're told that there was a sound like a blowing of a rushing wind. Blowing winds, the word is, literally means breath, breathe. God breathes on them. And the whole house is filled. And then we're told that what seemed to be tongues of fire came and separated out of the wind and came and rested on each of them. And then we're we're told that they are baptized, filled, immersed in the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. God breathes on them and they are filled and saturated with Holy Spirit. You remember that just a couple of days before that Jesus had ascended and said, wait, there's another that must come. I can only be with you one place at one time, but another will come who will be with you always. And so those early believers are filled with the Spirit. At Pentecost, God comes and lives with his people. Every single one of them experienced the nearness of God. Both New Testament accounts were transformative. The first seemed to give the disciples just courage to keep going, not to disperse and just to disappear, but to keep meeting and keep gathering and to keep waiting for something that God wanted to do. And then at Pentecost, they are set on fire, literally. Their hearts are set ablaze with a love for Jesus and they preach. 3,000 come to faith that in one day. 3,000 find faith in Jesus. And they then spread throughout the world, preaching, teaching, healing, driving out demons, performing miraculous signs, and the world has changed. Those handful of believers changed the world as we know it. Someone explained it once nicely that Bethlehem was God with us. The cross was God for us. Pentecost is God in us. That's a really helpful distinction. Bethlehem, God with us, cross, God for us, and Pentecost, God in us. That's what Pentecost, pouring of the Spirit on the church represents, is God with us, in us, at work in our lives. God making a home in me, and in you, and in us. There's a cute story of a minister in rural Africa was the only person in the village not to have been booked by a zealous traffic cop. And so one day he was cycling down the road and the policeman jumped out of the bushes in front of him, uh, uh, holding up his right hand and said to, to him, I'm gonna still get you, I'm still gonna get you at some point. And so the minister responded by saying, the Lord is with me still. Uh, and the cop replied, that's it, two on a bike, and booked him, gave him a ticket. Two, piece, two people on a bike, because the Lord was with him on his bicycle. That's Pentecost, the marvel and the mystery of God with me on my bike. God with me. Do you know that? God with you? God in you? Just a powerful realization that I live with the power and presence of the God who created the universe, raised Jesus from the dead, Miracle working God, supernatural God who holds all of creation in the palm of his hands lives in me and in you. I think we would live so much differently if we lived each day with that knowledge and that realization that the spirit of the living God 
lives in me. And so Pentecost expresses the wonder and the marvel. God in us. What does this have to do with us practically? Well, I realize that some of you have yet to have Jesus breathe possibly into you. You haven't yet found personal faith and connection with Christ. If that's you, then you first need to find Jesus before you can be filled with his spirit. The spirit only comes in when Jesus is in your life. Jesus is the door. He's the gate. We walk through to Christ and then the spirit comes into our lives. And so if you have yet to make that kind of promise, commitment, come to that realization that you need Jesus, then today is hopefully that day. You need to find Christ in order to have God live in you. When he comes into your life, you are born again, born of the Spirit. Many of us, if not most of us, are here this morning have found Christ. We are born again. We have God's Spirit living within us. But we realize, or I hope you realize, is that we need many fillings, not just one. We need many, many fillings. We need God to breathe on us again and again. Why? Because as Brent has said a number of times, we leak. We leak. We are at times fearful and distracted and lonely and isolated, sometimes dis disconnected. We're too busy. We're tired. We're emotionally stretched. We sin. We leak. As I prepared this week, there were three passages that I felt God gave to me for us this morning, and that was very briefly. Revelation 3 talks about some of us having lukewarm hearts. Our hearts have just grown lukewarm towards God. It's tepid. We're not fully engaged. Sort of a, we're, we're dabbling a little bit with him. Some of us are like Ezekiel 37, which we're going to sing about in just a moment, which speaks about a valley of dry bones, and that is that we're just spiritually dry. We have found faith with Christ, but somehow we've just run dry. We've lost that first love and that connection with him. Some of us are like the text in Luke 10 where Jesus talks to Martha. We have Mary sitting at his feet, loving him and worshiping him. And Martha's scurrying around and busy and, and she complains about this Mary sitting at his feet. And Jesus says to her these words, which have been echoing through my head in the last two weeks. You are worried and distracted about many things. Only one thing is needed. It's been going on in my head, maybe for me. Maybe it's not for you, but I'll share it with you anyway. You're worried and distracted by many things. All Christians have an appetite for more of God in their lives. I believe that. But we get distracted by earthly appetites and we lose our hunger for God. So some of us are lukewarm. Some of us are spiritually dry. Some of us are worried and distracted by many things. You see, without the fullness of the Holy Spirit, we attempt to live our Christian life by trying to see without eyes to hear without ears, and to breathe without lungs. You just can't do it. There can be no life without the life giver. We need to be filled. We need to be filled. And so this Pentecost, we revisit the wonder of what God has done, but perhaps more significantly what he wants to do today, to fill his people, to empower his church, to set them on fire for him, just in closing, there's a wonderful ascetic tale in which a rabbi asks his students, where is the spirit of God? And the student answers with the biblical phrase, the whole universe resounds with his glory, he thinks he's being clever, he's quoting scripture. And the rabbi says, no. The student confusedly asks, what do you mean, no? And the rabbi responds, God is where you let God come in. God is where you let God come in and so I guess it's a simple question this morning will you let more of God in amen let's pray and reflect for a few moments will you let more of God in opportunity for you just to be still and to pray fully respond to that question what will you say to the Lord this morning?
Lord Jesus, some of us have lost our first love. We have become lukewarm. Would you warm our hearts this morning and give us that love back? Some of us are spiritually just dry and empty. Would you come and fill us? Some of us are worried and distracted by many things. We've lost focus on you. Our eyes have strayed. Give us eyes only for you this morning. Give us eyes only for you. And then come and fill us as we have open hearts and open hands. Friends, I hope that was a blessing to you. Again, we'd love you to plug in and connect to us and to be the church rather than just watching church and so head to our website www.proteavalleychurch.org and you will find all of the relevant information there we'd love to help plug you into a midweek community we'd love to help you come and gather with us on sunday mornings we'd love to help find a space for you to serve one of the ways that you can start serving right now is to scan the code now for SnapScan. We'd love you to partner with us. Ministry costs money. We fund a whole bunch of international missionaries around the world who are taking the good news to the nations. We have absolutely loads of phenomenal life transforming local ministries in various places in our neighborhoods, in local townships, uh, through other organizations who we partner with. And we would love you to partner with us and that out of your money, we would see fruit, a harvest for Jesus kingdom. So please do scan that code and partner with us as we seek to see Jesus made famous amongst the nations here and right to the very ends of the earth. I pray that you have a great week worshiping Jesus and now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God who is our heavenly father and the friendship and fellowship of Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Go in peace and serve Jesus this week well. Amen.